Hey, everybody. I'm Andrew Brogdon, and welcome to the Ask Flutter Leadership Roundtable live at Flutter Engage. How live are we, you might ask? Let's just say there's a decent chance my daughter might wander in here at some point. So uh, if you see a four foot tall version of me wander into the shot, don't worry, it's all part of the fun. Uh, speaking of guests though, we have a bunch of leaders from Firebase and Flutter that have sat down to answer your questions. Let me get them introduced to you. Uh, first up, how about Eric Seidel, Flutter's Director of Engineering? Good morning, Andrew. Nice hey, to Eric. see you, nice to be here. <laughs> Uh, so, of course, you have been with Flutter since the beginning, right? Like you, you started with Flutter back before it was even called Flutter, right? Yeah, we, uh, we started this project uh, six and a half years ago now. Uh, Ian, myself, and a, a couple other uh, folks. And yeah, it's, it has been a wild ride. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being with us here today. Speaking of Ian, Flutter's tech lead, Ian Hickson. How are you doing? Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Yeah. And you were telling me the other day that you got started on the project when somebody passed you in a hallway. Is that right? That's right. Adam passed me in the hallway. Adam Barth, he, he was one of the other co-founders. And he asked me to write some documentation for us, write some specs for, for what the project was called at the time, Sky, I believe. And I was like, sure, right, I'll happy, happily write some, some specs for you. And then a few weeks later, I started writing code, and I never looked back. <laughs> that sounds like my story. I started coding and, and never didn't want to do anything else after that. Um, also with us is Mariam Hasnani, uh, a Flutter product manager for the web. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hmm. Uh, so Mariam, you're responsible for sort of defining how Flutter works on the web, right? Yeah, we've been hard at work, and we're excited for you to build with Flutter web. Awesome. Cool. And, and of course, last but not least, you know and love him from Stack Overflow and a bunch of Firebase videos, Frank Van Puffel, better known as Puff. Hey, Andrew, and hey, Flutter developers. I'm so excited to be here. I brought help. Sparky is going to answer the questions together with me, so it's going to be great. There you go. <laughs> awesome. And of course, speaking of questions, we have some that have come in on Twitter already and on YouTube comments from our promo video back uh, a week or so ago. But we are taking live questions. Behind the scenes, Andrew Fitzgibbon from the DevRel team is monitoring the YouTube chat and Twitter. And so if you have a question right now, Go ahead and type it into the chat. He'll be pulling those, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, that said, let's get going. Uh, first question up, well, looks like we have a, a fun one to start off with. What is the coolest Dash Atar you've created or seen? Um, Eric, do you want to start off with this? Sure. Uh, so full disclosure, my Dash Atar was the wizard uh, with a very pointy hat, maybe to match my pointy hair as a manager these days. Um, but I think the coolest one I've seen is the the knight with like the helmet and the sword. Uh, I didn't get that one, but uh, I, I really like it. Uh, Ian, how about you? I, I got the uh, I got a, a dash who was holding a tablet um, with with computer code on it, and when I looked very closely at the tablet, I noticed it was JavaScript, not Dart. So I suspect that she's been moonlighting on our Flutter web team. There you go. Well, speaking of Flutter Web, Mariam, did you get the same Dash Atar or did you get a different No, I, I did not. I didn't know that <laughs> we had Dash working on web. Um, but I think I got the superhero one. Um, but the coolest one I've seen on Twitter today is the one that looks like Tim, uh, Tim Sneed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Frank, what about you? Yeah, I did not see that one. But what I've been doing, actually, I've been trying to create a mashup of Dash and Sparky. So I've been meshing them together quite a bit. Didn't get it fully right. But luckily, the Flutter team came, came to the rescue. So if you check Firebase on Twitter, we actually have an awesome custom Dash Atar for us right now. Well, that's the, that's the poll you have with our team right there. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, awesome. Let's go into uh, another question. This one came in on Twitter. This is from John Bardo, I believe, or John Bardo. Uh, when will Flutter Web be ready for production? Eagerly waiting for it. Miriam, this you know you're the you're the PM for Flutter on the Web. What do you think? Uh, so great news. <laughs> um, as of today, <laughs> Flutter's web support is now available on the stable channel. Mm -hmm. So um, now you should be able to use web as a target device for your Flutter apps without having to enable any flags, um, which means for those of you who already have existing Flutter web apps, you can now build your app in the stable channel. Um, and if you're new to building Flutter web apps, check out flutter.dev web uh, for more on how to get started. 
Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, we just updated our getting started guides. So there's a lot of good resources there. Um, looks like we actually have a follow on sort of question. This one also came in on Twitter for you, Miriam, uh, from Chimon 1984. Chimon 1984. What is an ideal use case for Flutter Web? Uh, thanks, Chimon. That's a really good question. Um, so, with this initial release, we really focused on building a foundation for rich interactive web applications. Um, so think of things like if you have an existing Flutter mobile app, you can use the same code to build a web version um, and then expand your user base so that now you are reaching web users as well. Um, I think we're also additionally a good fit for building progressive web apps or PWAs um, or single page applications. So. Uh, those applications usually have a lot of dynamic content, a lot of interactive UI. Um, and so the reason we really believe those three are the best fit um, is that we still have some work to do around really supporting those uh, document-centric type pages uh, that you see on like traditional HTML um, with a lot of rich text static content. Um, and so I think right now we're really, really good for web applications. That is sort of Flutter's bread and butter, right? Application UI, right? Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chimon or Kaimon. Uh, 1984, that's a great question. Um, moving on, here's one from YouTube. This uh, and I'm sad I did not get this person's YouTube name. This comes to us from The Poignancy, uh, which is just an awesome name for an account. Will Flutterfire ever become an official Firebase SDK? And if so, when? Puff, I think this is your department. I think so too, and it's a great question. So thank you, Deploy and C. Um, yeah, we at Firebase, we, we love Flutter. And for those of you who don't know, there might be a few Flutter developers out there. But Firebase is a set of backend services that allows your Flutter application code to talk directly to our server-side functionality. So with Firebase, right, you can add sign-in by just writing Flutter code instead of having to spin up your own OAuth server, right? Or uh, directly talking to a database, right, without having to set up your own REST API. Um, yeah, and our team loves Flutter, right? Because we love being cross-platform, right? We're a cross-platform uh, development platform. And uh, yeah, Flutter is also cross-platform. So they go together like peanut butter and jelly or like Sparky and Dash, right? Now, um, it's a bit of a long answer. I think I have three parts for you. One of them is the first one, which is um, essentially the SDKs. And Firebase uh, has a lot of platforms that we support, but our primary SDKs are often iOS, Android, and web. It's one of the reasons we love that Flutter added web support. Um, and what we've done to make those available to your Flutter app is that we, we sort of take the official application or SDK, sorry, and we wrap that in some Flutter code to handle interrupt for you. And um, so those wrappers we call Flutterfire, but as soon as you're using uh, Firebase in your Flutter applications, you're already using the official SDKs because they're right under there. Now, that leaves the Flutter Fire library itself. And that library uh, is indeed, um, has been going through some changes. As Flutter has been adding uh, functionality platforms mostly, right? we also had to update that. So we've se been seeing some breaking changes there. And uh, those, yeah, have, have taken some, some iterations to get through. But I think we're now slowly stabilizing those. We, so we see more. Uh, stable uh, um, API releases coming there. If you find any issues, by the way, or if you see something that doesn't work the way you expect it to work, always report that on the open source uh, repo on GitHub because um, we might not know it if you don't tell us. So that's one. Second one is documentation. And uh, we have a getting started guide for Flutter and Firebase in the, the Firebase documentation on firebase.google.com. But after that, the best documentation lives at, and now I need to always check because I have this tab open in Chrome all the time. It lives on firebase.flutter.dev. Uh, so I never have to type that one. But uh, that's where you find great documentation that's really tailored to Flutter usage. So I highly recommend uh, checking that out. Um, one of the great things about that documentation is that it's also open source. So if you find a mistake in there, or if you think we could explain something better, that's great, because we're looking forward to either an issue report or a pull request. Third one is other things, other materials that we create, like, like video content. And last year, you might have seen that we've been uh, doing from the Firebase side more Firebase Flutter content. So we've, we've done a, uh, a few code labs, uh, a walkthrough video for these. I've done a live coding talk, nerve wracking, at the Firebase Summit. And then um, 
let's see, uh, Todd did a video, Todd Kerpelman, one of our uh, developer advocates, and actually he's, he's about to uh, finish a series on using real-time database in the Flutter application. I actually just realized that that might not be announced yet, so let's just keep it a secret between <laughs> us. Right? <laughs> no, yeah, so clearly, right, we are working hard uh, to support more of Flutter. Many Firebase like team members love Flutter uh, uh, probably as much as, as many developers out there. We're great fans, and we can't wait to bring more of Firebase to more of Flutter. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pub. And it sounds like there's some opportunity, you know, much like Flutter is open source pretty much completely, um, same is true for a lot of Firebase stuff, like these plugins for Flutter Fire. People can get involved if they want to, right? Exactly, yeah. All of this, uh, uh, most of our SDKs are developed in the open, right? So uh, we're always looking for, for people to uh, either contribute there or just tell us if something doesn't work, right? We test a lot, but we might not catch all bugs that you encounter. So. Yeah, a, a, great, a great bug report can, be, uh, can make a world of change. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you. And thank you again, the poignancy. Hopefully that was a poignant answer. But um, I'm uh, the next question comes from Netlinks, uh, and this looks like it might be one for Ian. Uh, with more than 8,200 open issues on GitHub, Flutter seems a bit understaffed. Are there any plans to improve the situation, or what are your priorities? Uh, Ian, as tech lead, you're, you're sort of in, in charge of our processes. You want to talk a little bit about issues and, and how they're managed? Yeah, sure. So we have, uh, as, as, the, as Netlinks says, we have 8,000 or so open issues. Uh, but the important thing is that we are uh, resolving issues about as fast as we're getting them. So, uh, for example, last year we had about 15,000 issues filed in our GitHub repo, and we closed about 15,000 issues. Uh, so we're actually pretty happy with the, the rate at which we're uh, fixing bugs and, and, and resolving bugs. Um, the, the number of issues is more a uh, marker of how many users we have, because the more users we have, the more bugs get filed. Um, and the, the number of issues we're resolving is more a marker of how uh, many people are contributing. And we have quite a few contributors. We have uh, over 200 people who are officially part of the Flutter Hackers group on GitHub. About a quarter of those are uh, part of the Google team. So most people who are contributing to Flutter are in fact not part of the Google Flutter team, but are part of the open source project. They might be from Microsoft or from Canonical or Nevercode or be volunteers who are working on their spare time. Uh, so obviously different people have different amounts of time that they're spending uh, contributing to uh, the product, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get more issues resolved uh, to make uh, Netlinks happier. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right, again, thank you for that question, Netlinks. Um, Looks like we have one from Miriam coming up. Uh, this is from Failali. Uh, this came out on Twitter as well. Uh, when will Flutter Web drop the hash in the URL, and why does it exist? So that pound sign that you see at the end of the URLs. That is an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let's start with the why does it exist. Uh, so today we use something called the hash URL strategy, and that is something we initialize when we are initializing the web engine. Um, so what that means is that when you have fluttered name routes, you are we're basically initializing those as part of the hash that's attached to the URL. Um, but now, today, uh, with this stable release, we have a way for you to customize that URL and drop the hash from the URL. That way, you can make your URL any way that you want, configure it with any um, other sub URLs you need to be able to deep link or share the URL with friends and family um, and users. Um, but then also we have a plugin uh, that somebody in the community has created, so thank you. Um, it's called URL Strategy and it basically does what the instructions we also have in our documentation do, um, but just in a very easier way, you just put it in your pub.dev and then you're able to configure your URL and drop the hash. Awesome. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, I, I know we've gotten some questions on that before, so I'm glad it came up, uh, came up today. Um, let's see what else we've got. Um, this one comes in from Silvio Plus. Um, Ah, Flutter is still having lots of compatibility issues with new, the new Max M1 architecture. Are you working on some solution 
or should I buy an old Intel Mac? <laughs> Eric, maybe this is a good one for you. I guess I would start by maybe saying you don't need to buy a new computer. <laughs> um, so I would encourage you to try again today. Um, there's been a whole lot of improvements to the M1 support as part of the Flutter 2 uh, release. Um, I'd also start by saying that um, advancements to platforms like M1 on the Apple side or things that come down from Android or, or other vendors are things that we uh, address immediately. So like we, we learn about the M1 uh, the same time you did. And we ordered an M1 dev box the same day they were available. And we've been working on them since. Uh, we broke down the M1 work into sort of three buckets, one of which is, you know, do apps run well on the M1? Uh, do the tools that are used to develop apps run well on the M1? And the third bucket being, you know, can we develop our own tools on the M1? Um, and the first two buckets, as far as I know, everything should pretty much work. Um, certainly with the Flutter 2 that came out today, certainly if you are hitting issues with the M1 or otherwise, uh, we want to hear about it. Uh, as Ian alluded to, we get a lot of issues every day. We triage them. Uh, and we want to address them as soon as possible. Uh, so yeah, try again with with uh, with uh, Flutter 2. Um, but I also would expect it to work well, and it's going to just continue to get better as we continue to you know make more code changes. What was interesting with the M1 is that it was almost like a whole new platform for us because we'd never done ARM as a host before. And so you know we announced today web and desktop, but really Silicon Apple Silicon was kind of its own other platform that we had to support. Uh, which is harder to get big banner messages for. You know, we oh, we now have some support for the current Mac OS release, uh, but it is still a, a significant amount of work. Yeah, I mean, you you sort of have to build that up from the ground level up, right? You got to first get make sure the Dart and the VM and all of that's working, and then you got to make sure you, the embedder is working, and then just go up through the layers of Flutter from there, right? Exactly. Very much like you would end up doing for a new platform. Yep. Uh, thanks, well, Sylvia. Hopefully, that uh, gives you a good bit of confidence about the M1 architecture. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, do the Flutter Dart teams ever plan to add official guidance for app architecture, uh, similar to Jetpack in Android? Ian, do you you might want to talk about this and also sort of how we where we decide to offer guidance and where we don't. That kind of because that's an interesting question too. I'm laughing because you're throwing this to me as if you don't know the answer, but you and I have been talking about this for several weeks. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we have in fact uh, just, uh, I think either today or very soon we'll be landing a new template uh, into the, the into the Flutter master branch. Um, and uh, that template will be uh, basically an answer to this question. It's, you know, how do you create an app with all the best practices, you know, state restoration, how do you have your app state and so on? Uh, it's not the only answer to the question. The whole point of programming is there are many answers to these questions and different apps have different needs. Uh, but we hope that this particular template will really help here. Uh, and we might create other templates in the future for different kinds of architectures. Maybe you'd rather use uh, Redux instead of the, the state mechanism that we have in this template. Uh, so this didn't land today for a Flutter 2, but it will hopefully be in the next day we'll release in a few months. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, this, these concerns show up for developer relations, you know, my team all the time. It's like, where are we really being useful by saying pe to people, this is the well-lit path and we, we recommend it? And where would we be cutting off people from their own ideas that might in fact be better in the long run, right? We took a long time before we ever sort of anointed a state management approach as a good one for beginners. You know, we settled on provider, which is a great package uh, from Remy. Um, but we, because we didn't want to sort of solve that problem in a way that would stop other people from solving it in ways that might be better. Uh, awesome, okay, let's um, let's see what we've got coming in on the chat. Um, this is from Khaled Ahmed. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, will null safety break existing apps? Is there some stuff that needs to be migrated? Um, who might want to take that one? Eric, do you want to take a stab at it? I mean, you certainly know a lot about null safety. Uh, yeah, I think that probably Ian or I could answer this. The the idea is that you should be able to migrate. Like when null safety was designed to be an upgrade. Um, you uh, there's even a tool that you can use. I, I believe it's called uh, Dart Dart Fix, um, and you can run it on your on your code base, and it will help you uh, go through changing. Uh, to your code to make it null aware. Ian might have more to say. 
uh, Dart Migrate, I believe, is a tool. But yeah, it'll, it'll run, it'll give you uh, suggestions. Uh, if you look earlier in the keynote, we, we have a whole section that talks about how it works. Um, the idea is it should not be breaking. Uh, the, you really would like your dependencies to be migrated first. Uh, your life will be harder if you migrate before your dependencies migrate. It's, it's possible, but it'll be less effective. Uh, so, you know, if you have a package that you're using that isn't mi migrated yet, go ask the developer of that package to migrate. Um, but uh, otherwise, you should be good to go. And uh, yeah, it should not be particularly breaking. There's no, um, as was mentioned in the keynote, this is why we not we are not calling this release Dart 3. It's Dart 2 because it is, in fact, backwards compatible with non, uh, non safe Dart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and it's uh, just like any other language feature, it's in the pub spec. You declare which Dart language version you, you want to roll with. And so if you're Dart 2.12.0 or higher, then you're opting in. Uh, we just went through this process for um, our samples in the Flutter samples repo. Uh, and we did it just as, they, as Ian was just describing, sort of we looked at our samples and how many had a dozen dependencies and how many had zero dependencies. And we just sorted them in a spreadsheet by that and started at the top and went down from there. Um, and so we're in the actually literally right now landing those in the Flutter samples repo now that the uh, the release has gone out. Um, the other good thing about the way we deployed uh, null safety is you can literally uh, compile an app that has non null safe code and null safe code simultaneously, and the compiler will use null safety optimizations and and uh, the ability to know what the types are when it's compiling the null safe code and then when it might when it has a boundary to non null safe code it will add null checks for you uh, we we call this um, non sounds null safety if i remember correctly uh, and so you can you can run your app in mixed mode essentially with both uh, types of code in there and that should work fine yeah i know the dart team is very specific about the sound null safety is the particular type that dart offers uh, which has some advantages because once you have that for all your code, there are a lot of checks you don't need to make anymore, and it can make your code yeah. a little bit faster and tighter. Um, I imagine there'll be a lot more detail on that in Leaf's talk later today. Uh, so if folks interested in null safety, you're going to want to stay stay on the line for that one. Um, but thanks. Um, let's see, we've got another live question. This one comes from Ankit Kumar. Is Flutter good for 3D rendering? That's an interesting question. Uh, Puff looks like he's interested in it. I, I don't know, Eric or Miriam or Ian, who, who'd be interested in that one? I, I can take it. Um, I mean, we've built Flutter as a 2D system. That said, lots of people have done 3D with it. Um, the APIs that we uh, provide are for you know, drawing 2D objects uh, on a screen, you know, as you would use for uh, a typical mobile app. Um, but the transforms that we use do support 3D. So people have done uh, interesting, you know, two and a half D or 3D uh, sort of uh, setups. Uh, also, Flutter, the Flutter content itself can embed other uh, textures, other OpenGL textures. So you could write some OpenGL code to write some 3D and then embed the resulting OpenGL texture in the rest of your Flutter app. And we've seen folks do that. In fact, I think even uh, in the keynote, there was this mention of um, the Wallace and Gromit app at the end. And that has uh, both 2D and 3D in it. I think some of the 3D parts are done in Unity. Um, I'd have to go look uh, and learn more. But uh, mashing the two together is possible. Uh, but again, the bulk of Flutter is designed around a 2D uh, experience. I believe um, Grant Skinner, who everybody saw in the keynote doing some wonderful things with Flutter Folio, has also had done some vignettes for Flutter that had some of them had some 3D elements just spicing up and adding some interesting design mm -hmm. aspects to what would otherwise be 2D app UI. Uh, and I believe you can find those on G Skinner's site. So those are worth checking out as well. He did some wonderful things there, uh, his team rather. Uh, awesome. Uh, let's try another live question. This is from Blessing George Varghese or Varghese. Uh, what about Flutter for desktop? Um, Ian, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about where we are on desktop? Yeah, we uh, we have Flutter for Desktop is available now in the stable channel, uh, although we don't consider it to be fully stable yet. Um, we support uh, Mac OS, we support uh, Windows, and we support Linux currently. Um, what more is there to say? Uh, we, <laughs> we don't support necessarily all the features you might want. For example, we don't yet have support for uh, multi-window, although that is coming. We have some efforts uh, going there. Uh, but support for you know your basic uh, one window app is is pretty solid. Uh, I've done a 
bunch of them myself. Uh, there's an app I wrote uh, for solving Sudokus that I uh, run regularly on my Mac, um, and it works great. Yeah, I would say just a little bit more. Um, like one of the things I love about Flutter Desktop, and particularly love about it now being available in the Sable channel, is it's just so nice for development. Like it's just so you just turn it on, and then you just Flutter run, and just boom, it's right there. Um, and it's it's great for that sort of workflow. Um, so yeah, try it, check it out, and send some feedback. Oh, I guess one other thing I would say is that uh, it's been amazing to me the overlap between Flutter Web and Flutter Desktop. We sort of think about the desktop work in sort of splitting into two camps. One is like, how do you teach Flutter about what a mouse and keyboard are? And what a mouse and keyboard are, like we had to do that for the web because the web has so much sort of desktopiness in it in parts. But then there's also the other part, which is like, well, how do you teach the Flutter um, engine to run a really big phone that's plugged into the wall? Um, and you know, that it comes in Mac, Linux, and, and, and Windows flavors. And, and that sort of uh, engine level work uh, is, is sort of what Ian was alluding to. Like we have an engine for Mac, we have an engine compiled for Linux, and we have an engine compiled. And that's maybe less far along than the like, can you use a mouse and keyboard with Flutter? Which you can, because we put it on the web now. So yeah. hope that helps. I, I would add to Eric um, exactly what you said. A lot of what we needed to do to make web stable was to have those desktop form factors supported. Um, being able to use your trackpad, your scroll wheel, your keyboard to interact with your web app on, on desktop browsers. Um, but I'd also look at uh, GSkinner's Flutter Folio, and you can kind of see how you can build mobile, web, and desktop app across the board, and how those features go across those three different platforms, and where we use each of them. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting to, to look at why we haven't yet labeled desktop as stable. And two of the big reasons are we don't have good testing on our own side to make sure that we don't regress desktop when we add new features. And that might not matter so much to someone writing an, a desktop app, but it, it matters a lot to us because we want to make sure that when we write new code for desktop, we don't break things that are already working. The other big thing that we don't have uh, solid support yet is accessibility. And we have a plan for that. We're working on that. We have code being developed for that. Uh, but it, it wasn't ready for today, so that's why we we don't see that as a, a stable product. It's still a, a beta level product. Um, but again, if you have an app that you don't need uh, accessibility support for, maybe you're running it on some sort of kiosk or something like that, then uh, that may be less important to you. Um, but we, we consider those two features in particular to be really critical before we're willing to, to put the label stable on anything. Yeah, it's a lot of responsibility to make sure you're not breaking six platforms as opposed to not breaking three platforms, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I wanted to, to make sure uh, folks are clear on, uh, you mentioned that the desktop support, the beta snapshot of desktop is currently available in the Flutter 2 stable channel release. Is that right? I believe that is accurate. Okay. And so that's so people can just have an easier time trying out desktop support as it exists now right from there, the, the same version of the SDK they currently have installed, right? Right. Awesome. Yeah, so if you want the latest of desktop, it's better to use it on beta because that's where the updates will be. But you're just going to get a snapshot of what it is today on stable. So if you if you have an existing app, you just kind of want to see what it looks like on desktop. Sounds like you can do that right from the stable channel. Uh, but the latest and greatest would be either on dev or on beta. Awesome. And there's something really magical about having written an app for, say, Android, and then just running it on your Mac or running it on your Linux box. And it just works. And it's just, it's, kind of, it's a very weird experience to have done that. I haven't, I haven't experienced that before. Uh, you know, with the web, you kind of have that when you write your, your web app and it works in one browser and it works on a different browser on, on your laptop and a different browser on your phone. Uh, but it's, it's really kind of a magical experience to have that with a, a native app. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, well, hopefully that was a lot of detail for you. Uh, blessing George Varghese, Varghese about Flutter on desktop. Um, let's take another live question. This is from Shekhar Shashank. Uh, what is the best way to learn state management packages like Riverpod? It's sort of an interesting question about how to approach um, Maybe that's a dev should does, would anybody be offended if I took that one? Even though I'm the host, I'm not really supposed to answer questions. Is that is that okay? 
Please, okay. I was hoping you would take this one. <laughs> All right, sure. Far away. Yeah, this is this is my jam. Um, one of the, I, I would say, the best way to learn anything with Flutter is to just start coding. Um, that's that's how I've done most of my learning with Flutter. It um, one of the nice things about Flutter being entirely open source is that when you do run into a crash or something like that, you can go really far down into open source code before anything would stop you. Uh, this is how I learned most of the Flutter SDK. Uh, and Riverpod, which is made by Remy, uh, he also very good about documenting his code. So if you ever run into any issues while you're playing around with it or just having some fun, you can go straight into the source and see his dark doc comments and see how everything works. Um, also, I would say one of the wonderful things about Flutter is that we have a global developer community who are fun and energetic and welcoming. Not only are they happy to answer questions generally on sites like Stack Overflow and stuff like that, but a lot of them are out there on YouTube right now putting out videos, putting out blog posts and stuff like that. Riverpod has attracted a bunch of users, and so you can find a lot of resources from people who are a few steps further down the road on their learning journey with that particular package than you are. Um, and they've, they've turned around and, and offered help to you along your way. So if you, you know, the best way, just do a search on YouTube, do a search on a uh, blogging platform of your choice, and your odds are you're gonna find some folks who uh, have already tried whatever it is that you're interested in learning and have left some breadcrumbs for you on your own journey. Um, yeah. All right, uh, let's see. I think we got, uh, let's go back to some of the questions we got earlier uh, on Twitter and YouTube. This is one, uh, this is clearly a Miriam question. What about SEO in Flutter Web? Is it supported? If yes, let us know. Thanks. What do you think, Miriam? <laughs> uh, I had a feeling this question was coming. Um, so uh, Flutter started uh, as a fork of Chrome. And so indexability has like always been on our mind. Um, it's just with this release specifically, we really optimized for web applications and focused on customers, our early adopters that were already building applications with the web. Um, and so that being said, uh, although indexability is something we're looking into, it is a lot of work to get supported. Um, and so if you are looking for building very document centric, very text heavy and just site websites that need that SEO support, um, Flutter might not be the right choice for you currently. Um, we do have ways that you can access the browser and DOM because we do use the web platform and that is what Flutter Web is built on. Um, so there might be ways that you can find to embed those APIs and the meta tags that you might need for SEO using things like platform views. Um, but as of now, we are looking into it and we would love to understand what exactly your use cases are, how you use SEO today. So file issues on GitHub so we can learn more. Um, but it is it is on our roadmap. It is something we'll look into. Uh, but as of today, we're best for web applications. Awesome, thank you, Miriam. And uh, just to echo what you said there at the end, filing issues, uploading issues, and adding comments and context to issues that's one of the best ways for developers to sort of steer the SDK and provide their input. Do I have that right? Exactly. Yeah, a lot of, oh, sorry, Ian. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of what we've built for Flutter Web is from hearing what our customers needed at the time that they were building with beta and the tech preview. Um, so the best way to shape our future stable releases is to tell us what we can work on. Ian, did you have anything to add there, or is Marion pretty much got it? No, that was pretty much it. We, we very much use the issues as a way to prioritize. We look uh, specifically around thumbs up on issues, because uh, GitHub makes it really easy to sort by thumbs up on the first issue, uh, first comment in an issue. Uh, so yeah, definitely thumb up issues that you like, uh, file issues if you can't find one, uh, that is the best way to uh, help us. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that it's, oh, I was just to say, I don't know that it's commonly understood how open Flutter is, because I, I just don't, not all projects are run this way, but like all of our designs are, docs are public. All of our issues are public. Basically, whenever we do anything, we do it in the public. And so, yes, it, there may be a lot of issues to look through um, and, you know, to find the issue that you want, um, but it's all done in the public. And uh, so, you know, either you can watch us do it or you can contribute and, and, and you know, join forces and help us make it better. Yeah, I've, I've come from a long history of open source and open standards. And so I've been trying really hard to push that culture into the Flutter project, I think pretty successfully. 
Uh, we have you know an open Discord where all of our conversations happen. We have open GitHub issues where all our issues happen. Our project planning happens in in Google uh, GitHub projects. Sorry, uh, our design docs are in public Google Docs. Uh, so yeah, we we are very much an open project. And um, if you're interested in contributing, we have a contributing guide on GitHub. Um, check it out. Follow the links. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so uh, hopefully that gets a, a good answer for search engine optimization there and a little bit on contributing. Um, let's take another one from YouTube. Uh, when will the problem of janky animations on the first opening of an app be resolved, especially with metal? Um, Eric, I think I've seen you doing a, a little talk on speaking of GitHub issues, doing some some stuff on this. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, this has been a, a popular topic, uh, particularly the last few weeks. And I, I wrote a long post on Reddit. I'm actually in the in the middle of working on a longer blog post. Um, I guess I would open by saying performance is something that is like a grounding principle of Flutter. Uh, when we first talked about the project five plus years ago, you heard us talk first about performance. When you heard us talk about the pillars of the things that we're trying to accomplish, performance is you know the number one. Uh, and that's not just you know that's not just words. Like we back that up by you know, every commit that's ever checked in uh, is compared against all sorts of uh, performance tests uh, across the board, across all the platforms. Uh, performance is something that we we, we, we strive for, we drive towards uh, every day. Um, specifically regarding to jank and, and first run animations, uh, that's an issue that we have been aware of for a while. Uh, and particularly on iOS, it uh, did get worse in some scenarios uh, within the last year. Uh, with the migration from uh, OpenGL to Metal, where we're no longer able to cache the shaders, which are the little programs that you have to run on the GPU to actually produce the pixels. Uh, we're no longer able to cache the shaders between runs as, as well as we were before. Uh, so the short and the long of it is we're aware that there are issues here, um, and we are hard at work on it. Uh, lots of people working on this problem. Uh, Ian is working on this problem. Uh, and by this problem, I mean the, the general problem of performance and how do we make it better um, all the time. We think we're doing pretty well, and we can always do better. Yeah, around the, the what I've been calling the early onset uh, jank issues, uh, that's very much something I'm focused on right now. If you look at uh, GitHub uh, project 188, I remember the number by heart because I open it so often. Uh, that's where I've been tracking all the bugs about this. Uh, the best thing you can do uh, to echo what we just said in the last question, the best thing you can do to help us here, if you are seeing jank at the start of the application, please file a bug with code that reproduces the problem, include a video showing the jank, and include a timeline trace showing what your app is actually doing during that video. That is by far the most helpful thing you can do, because then we can study uh, that particular case of jank. They are not all caused by the same problem. Uh, even if they're caused by shaders, they're not necessarily caused by the same shaders. Uh, you know, we have some examples of early onset jank that are caused by one particularly uh, uh, pathological shader case. And we have another example that's, uh, oh, we happen to specialize the shader based on the rounded rect radius. And so every frame during the animation where you're animating the rounded rect radius, we have to compile a new shader. And so those, uh, those different bugs will be solved with different problems. One of them presumably will be solved by just not specializing the shader based on the rounded rect radius. And the other one might be solved by fixing the code we're writing for that particular shader. Uh, but we won't know what your specific jank problem is unless you file a bug uh, with code that we can look at. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, performance is sort of, it's a, I would say it's a multivariable equation, but it's, that's not giving it justice, right? Like there's so many variables that go into that and so many special cases. Um, so again, this is absolutely an area where we can uh, use some great help from our community. Awesome. Um, let's see. I think we have another question relating to Flutter Web. How does Google plan to use Flutter Web internally? Um, Eric, you you speak for the team a lot internally, talking to other other groups. Do you want to take this one? Uh, so I can't you know speak to other teams' plans per se, but I can say that there are a number of teams who are experimenting with Flutter Web today. Flutter Web just came to the stable channel today, and similarly, we've been uh, we've been giving similar guidance to, to internal teams. Uh, that we're you know still working on things, uh, so there's nothing to announce today. But I, I do expect to see more usage of Flutter Web. Uh, I mean, Google engineers have similar constraints to any engineers you know 
listening, right? We, we still have to write for lots of screens. And uh, I think, I, I mean, I'm working on this project because I believe that uh, it's a better way to develop when we write our code once and then we get to deploy it uh, lots of places. And so I suspect that we have seen we have seen a lot of Google Teams adopt that strategy already with Flutter, and I expect that we will see even more uh, as Flutter goes to continue to more goes to more places. We've also seen uh, Flutter for web being used internally for internal tools, uh, where there isn't necessarily a, a, a big team behind the tool, and they need to create something that is useful and productive quickly. Uh, and so, for example, just on the Flutter team, for example, we use Flutter Web for some of our internal tools for uh, migrating the public Flutter code into our internal repository for teams like GPay and other teams to use. And the, the tool that does that is itself written in Flutter. We also, uh, to add to Ian, we also use Dart DevTools is built in Flutter Web. Um, so that's a great example. And we're hoping to showcase that as a way of using Google technology, both internally and externally, um, because those toolings, that same tool is available internally as well. I actually used Flutter for web to, to build an internal tool myself. Now that I'm a manager, uh, I was I made a little tool to help people get uh, GitHub searches to see what pull requests they've done over the source of, over the course of six months or so. Uh, and and Puff, this may be interesting to you. I actually deployed it to Firebase hosting, and the new thing that you all have to, to that puts like automatic GitHub actions mm -hmm. into your project took like five minutes for me to get like from my laptop up online at, at uh, a web.app domain. So I don't know who works on that, but give them two thumbs up for me. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> definitely, awesome. one, no, definitely one of the popular features we've uh, released last year, right? It's that you can, from a GitHub action, automatically create a URL in Firebase hosting, a preview URL or a live URL. And that's really awesome. We see lots of uptake of that, yeah. And it merges really well with uh, uh, Flutter Web, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, awesome. Okay, let's take uh, another question. This is from uh, FluDev, perhaps short for Flutter Dev. Um, can we do mediation with AdMob in Flutter? If yes, then how will it be implemented? And I think I just talked myself into answering your question again. Uh, does anybody else want to cover this? Because I'm I'm the weird oddball former ads person on the call. Maybe okay. Um, Sure. Uh, yeah, a little bit of personal history. I came from Ads Devrel, mobile Ads Devrel. Uh, how I, I ended up on uh, the Flutter team because I worked on the AdMob plugin for Flutter. That's how I got hooked on it. Um, so yeah, uh, as you as you saw, we had a wonderful announcement about the Google Mobile Ads plugin for Flutter today. Uh, mediation is not in its list of supported features. I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, because the plugin uses the same native SDKs under the hood as you would use on any other Flutter or uh, any other Android or iOS app, um, mediation is it is in there, and you could, in theory, set up an ad unit and and, and try to take advantage of it by bundling in the right native SDK uh, and adapter. Uh, I should mention, by the way, for those of you unfamiliar with mediation. Um, it's a feature where the Google Mobile Ads SDK can load and display ads from another ad network's SDK, like the Audience Network or Mopub or, or uh, another one. Um, but it's not officially supported. And the reason it's not officially supported has to do with testing. Uh, one of the reasons um, that the uh, we're being uh, taking so much care in putting out the Google Mobile Ads plugin is that if you're going to put out something relating to monetization, it has to be right. It has to be tested and 100% you're completely confident that it's right because it, this relates to somebody's livelihood, right? Like if I have a bug in one of my apps, it crashes and somebody's sad for a minute. If you have a bug in your ads SDK, it could mean that somebody's business is, is threatened uh, or you know somebody can't pay, keep the lights on in their office. That's a very big responsibility. Uh, and that's, um, that's why so much testing and so much cooperation with the ads team has gone into the current release of the mobile ads plugin. And that's what they're going to do with mediation before saying that it too is fully supported and ready for production. Uh, so it is on the roadmap, but I wouldn't try it just yet. That's my answer there. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's take another one. This one comes from uh, Sananth, uh, Sananth Kumar Yu. Uh, when will Dart support WebAssembly? Um, Ian, I'm thinking maybe this might be a good one for you. Yeah, so this could mean a number of different things. Uh, we actually use uh, WebAssembly today uh, as part of Flutter for Web. 
uh, and maybe uh, Miriam can talk more about this in a minute. Uh, but basically, we we have uh, two other parts of WebAssembly that could be relevant for Dart. One of them is whether you could compile Dart itself to WebAssembly, and the other one is whether you could take code already compiled to WebAssembly and link to it from Dart. Uh, so for the second one, linking to WebAssembly code from Dart, I believe there's a package that already exists uh, that uses Dart FFI to uh, load up a WASM runtime and therefore let you connect to WASM code. Uh, that's not the most convenient way of doing it, but it, it sort of works today. The other option, or the other, the other way of using WebAssembly with Dart would be to compile Dart itself to WebAssembly. Uh, that is not possible today. That's going to require features in WebAssembly that aren't really mature yet, like WebAssembly garbage collection, WebAssembly threading, and so forth. Uh, these are things that we're very interested in. I think uh, WebAssembly has the, the potential to become really a, a, a uniform language interrupt uh, technology in, in a few years. And so I'm really hoping that we can uh, adopt that in Dart as well. Uh, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, and it will take some time, I think, together. Miriam, do, do you want to add something about how we do WebAssembly with, uh, with Canvas Kit? Yeah, um, so today we have two renderers for Flutter Web. Uh, we have our default, or what used to be our default, HTML render, where we use HTML and DOM backend uh, in our web engine to render your application on the web. Um, but we have been experimenting with Canvas Kit, and today we have stabilized it so that you can use Canvas Kit, which uses WebAssembly and WebGL uh, to render your app as a skia in the browser. Um, and so with those two different renders, we also have something called auto. And that's what we've set your all Flutter web apps to run by default. Um, and auto basically means that we use Canvas Kit on desktop browsers, and we use HTML renderer on mobile browsers, um, just to optimize for the benefits and the strengths of both. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Miriam. Um, let's see. Let's uh, let's take some live questions. We have about fifteen minutes left, I think, in our block. Uh, we are still taking live questions from the chat and on Twitter using the Asflutter hashtag. Um, I always like to go back to Twitter, by the way, and see if I can answer some of the ones that we weren't able to get to live. So if we don't get to your question here, uh, hopefully we'll have some time to to come back and answer it after the fact. Uh, but let's take a live question. This is uh, from BJ Kumar. One word about Flutter Web uh, in comparison to React and Angular. Um, let's see, Miriam or or Ian, uh, what do you what do you think about that? What are some of the differences between the those three things? Okay, uh, Ian, did you want to take it or <laughs> or Eric? <laughs> I feel like Eric has something to say. Um, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is that like Flutter Web, like we just draw to a canvas. <laughs> Um, you know, so we really treat it like we have access to the CPU or the GPU, like we do on a native platform, which is, I think, different from how I see Angular and React working. But that's the first thing that jumps out to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I always agree feel. With you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. You got it. I was going to say I always feel uh, uh, reluctance to compare Flutter to other technologies because we all have valid use cases. Like all the different technologies sure. have valid use cases, and I don't really want to speak for. React and say, oh, React is good at this, but is not good at that. that that's really up to, to React. Uh, we are very happy to coexist uh, with these other technologies. And uh, we hope that the community as a whole can write guides that say, you know, here's when Flutter is, is good, here's when Flutter for Web is good, here's when React is good, and so on. Yeah, I was going to answer the same way as you, Ian. Um, I don't know if anyone caught caught Dion um, at the keynote, but I think he put it really well that uh, the web platform has opened it up to so many frameworks, and Flutter is just another one that is taking advantage of all the web that all that the web has to offer. Um, and so we just want to see what you build with it, and we're going to try to suit it best for the things that you want to build with it. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Ian and uh, Miriam. Uh, let's go to another live question. This comes from uh, MDPE uh, underscore IR. I am on the beta channel right now. Should I go to stable channel? I 
I think the gag here is that the beta channel just became the stable channel earlier this morning. Do I have that correct? <laughs> that is right. Um, it's it's really hard for me to answer that question because I usually spend most of my time on tip of tree on all the projects I use, which of course means that half the time I'm broken uh, and the other half of the time I use the absolute latest features. So I'm really the wrong person to answer this. <laughs> Eric, do you have opinions about what channel people should use? I, I think that it really comes down to your interest in update frequency and uh, sort of how much testing is received. So say stable only updates about once a quarter and many, many apps and many, many tests have, have run before that code is ever pushed to stable. Uh, beta is updated about once a month. Um, also has a lot of testing, you know, both in terms of apps and tests, uh, but less than, than stable. Uh, in part because, as Ian says, right, we promote the best uh, beta of the last while to be uh, the stable. And similarly, dev. Dev is updated, mm, I want to say, anywhere between about every day uh, to at least once a week. Um, and there again, we go through a promotion process of, of you know, picking the best recent dev and, and making that the, 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 the beta. So I, I think it's a trade off, but I think most individuals probably want to be on stable or maybe beta. But the other big difference between the others. The other big difference between stable and uh, beta and the other channels is that for stable and to a lesser extent beta, but certainly for stable, we will cherry pick fixes if there's something egregiously bad. So if we find a regression that we're like, oh, we didn't catch that, we should have caught that, then we will go and cherry pick a fix onto that stable release. And so you'll see over the quarter, the stable release gets updates, very minor updates, but updates for issues that we think are serious enough that they warrant a out of band fix that will not happen on dev we just don't we don't check on dev if something is broken on dev it'll be fixed on on the trunk and then we'll do another dev in a few days time uh and obviously that can't happen on the main line because that's where we're developing um so there's always a risk the 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 more recent of the code the the higher the risk that something is wrong that we haven't caught uh, but of course, there's also going to be new fixes there, so it's a trade-off. Mm -hmm. I assume previously people were using the beta channel because web was not available on stable, so that could be a reason that you could switch to stable now because we do have web and desktop that you could run your app with. Yep. Yeah, that right. very much applies to me, Miriam, indeed. I'm switching back to stable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and in our samples repo, we just had a whole bunch of uh, samples for the web now that we don't have to uh, put a special little notice on, like, by the way, if we're going to run this, go switch channels, because now they're they're running in stable. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's let's go to another live question here. Um, uh, Ali Reza Izizade, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, when will you add data classes to Dart? Uh, check issue 314 of Dart Lang, Dart Lang, which has a lot of thumbs up. Um, this makes me wish Bob were here. Uh, but Ian or Eric, you might have a, a take on this. Miriam as well. Who, uh, so Bob already talking? covered it in the keynote. Um, we are uh, actively trying to find a good way to do this. We want to be really careful in how we do this. We don't want to uh, add a syntax that works today but doesn't work in six months' time, doesn't work in two years. And we don't want to keep adding new syntaxes every few months. Uh, or every few years, just to end up with a lot of uh, kind of obsolete language features that aren't used by anyone. So we're looking at uh, metaprogramming. We're looking at uh, ways that we can really handle a large number of use cases that exist today and hopefully in an extensible fashion. Uh, we have no idea when this will be done. Uh, it really depends on what kind of ideas we manage to come up with and how well they work. Uh, we'll be going through a lot of testing through this. Uh, I'm sure if you follow the bugs, uh, for example, the one that's listed here, which I'm sure I'll go and check out after this uh, talk. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll see our progress there. Uh, this is this is another area where the fact that the Dart language team hasn't yet found the right way to step in and implement something has also allowed other people the chance to explore their own ideas, right? Like uh, build value, for example, can create. Uh, data, use source generation to create data classes that have a lot of features like immutability and, and serialization. I know Freezed, uh, again, from Remy, is a very popular library that a lot of people are using. Uh, so there are options out there for folks right now. Um, 
even though the DART uh, language team hasn't settled on what they feel the correct approach is for what they're going to implement. Yeah, and we have a relatively mature code generation mechanism in Flutter and Dart today, uh, but it's code generation, so it has all the downsides of code generation, um, which is why we don't think that's the final solution to this problem. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, let's see, another one. Um, what would be the best way to develop a Flutter app that needs to work online and completely offline? I'm guessing that's about data, accessing network data, and maybe storing it locally, dealing with connection status. Puff, do you want to talk about this a little bit? It's kind of up your alley. Yeah, and I actually think I saw it coming in, and this is a really great question. It was a bit more. It was about gathering data in an offline scenario, right? So you gather the data when you don't have a network connection, and then you want to synchronize between the database when you're back online. And uh, there's many ways to do this, some of them involving Firebase, but definitely also some that don't involve Firebase. I will focus on the Firebase ones, but the same type of, type of model works for, for many approaches. But what's key here is that essentially when you use uh, one of our Firebase databases, we have the so-called real-time database or Cloud Firestore. They work in a very similar way. They keep a local cache of any data that you've recently read from the database into your client-side application. Because keep in mind, these are cloud-hosted databases, right? So uh, they, right, any data that you've recently read from the database is kept in a local cache. And that means that we can uh, access the data again if you restart the app while you're offline. And so that's one thing uh, that both of them do. And that's what you want, right? You want that local cache. And then you get the dealing with local write operations, right? You're gathering local data and you want to write them to the database. And in both cases, right, what both databases do is they keep a queue of pending writes, right? So we essentially just keep track of what have you written locally that we haven't synchronized to the server yet. And this doesn't affect your application. You still see the data as if it's been modified already on the server. But we then, on the background, actually check. It's like, hey, do we have a network connection? And once we have a network connection, we start synchronizing all the changes to the server. And that could lead to, for example, uh, the server rejecting a change if a user is trying to write something that they don't have permission to. And then we actually locally reconcile those uh, rejections also. So we fire events so that the UI can reflect the database state. That's actually one of my favorite things I always notice about uh, using something like Firebase with a Flutter application, right? is the reactive nature of this. Um, I always love when you are uh, connecting to the database. And if I then make a change to the database, it just snap also updates on, uh, on the Flutter application. I really love that about dealing with a remote database in a reactive way. So great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I imagine your favorite widget is Stream Builder, right, Puff? Mm -hmm, very much. It's between uh, 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 Stream Builder and Future Builder, indeed. Yes. There you go. All right. Uh, well, cool. Uh, another live question. Um, what is the difference between legacy version and null safety version uh, while collaborating Flutter Fire plugin with Flutter? That comes from Mittal Rakolia. Um, so the difference between, I guess, the the existing version and then the new null safety versions of Flutter Fire. Do you want to talk a little bit about the migration of those plugins, maybe, and where we are with that? I'll completely admit that I haven't checked yet what's in the latest version. I know that the team has been working on null safety for sure. I don't know what you will need to do yet. So this is one where I might have to come back to it on uh, Twitter. Although I'm not sure, Ian, I saw that you also commented on this. So I'm not sure if you have any more information already. If not, I will get back on, on Twitter for sure. I believe the Flutterfire plugins are uh, migrated now, but I'm not 100% sure, I must admit. There's a yeah, lot of plugins. We've been tracking all of the different plugins that we uh, release and make sure that they're all updated. And there's a lot of them that I've lost track of which ones we've migrated and which ones we haven't. We've migrated most of them at this point. Yeah, I saw indeed a lot of like releases coming in. I just didn't have time to check what, what as the developer you need to do for them. But yeah, I think those all went out also today. Yeah, if they're not out today, they'll be out very soon. Cool. Um... Well, there you go. Let's uh, let's do one more live question. This is uh, from Ayaz Hoda. Um, what is a good IDE for Flutter? That's going to have about as many answers as there are people on this stream, I think. <laughs> or right more. Now. Uh, this could be this could be fun. I use IntelliJ's IDEA. That is my preferred one. Uh, Eric, I don't know. What, what do you use? Uh, honestly, I mostly use VS Code. Um, I've used Android Studio some too, but I. Um, the coding that I do tends to be more in VS Code. Okay. Ian, I assume you have a favorite, right? I, I use Emacs, and you'll pry it out of my gold dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one of those. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
Uh, Miriam, <laughs> what about uh, what about you? Um, okay, so as a PM, I use all possible just to make sure things work. <laughs> um, but I did, when I joined the Flutter team, I did start with Android Studio because a lot of the tutorials, like the App Brewery one, uh, sets you up that way. And then I moved on to VS Code because that's kind of what I'm used to. And then I've recently been testing out IntelliJ, making sure our cool new inspector widgets and all that uh, work with it. <laughs> Awesome. I guess and and that, Puff, any, any yeah, preferences in the Firebase team? That leaves me, right? Yeah, I mostly use Visual Studio Code for things where I need to integrate with Firebase, but I actually have a real soft spot for Dartpad also. I just love tinkering with, <laughs> uh, with widgets without having to open any IDE just in my browser. It's one of my favorite things. Program, sort of a more serious answer to this question is that uh, we really try and make sure that uh, all of the IDEs can work with Flutter. Uh, we have a open, uh, kind of an API that you can talk to if you're an IDE. And that's how all of our plugins talk to the Flutter tool. Uh, so there's very little bespoke code in the IDEs about uh, running Flutter or compiling and so forth. Uh, and this means that uh, if you have an IDE that doesn't yet have a, a plugin, it's possible someone will write or you could write a plugin for that IDE using the Flutter tool. Uh, and it also means that if you have an IDE that you want to use but doesn't really have strong Flutter support, you can use it from the command line. All of the same things that the IDEs do is, are possible from the command line by and large, except things like you know, auto fixes and, and, and refactorings. Mm -hmm. um, but even, for example, our analyzer tool has a mode in which it operates at the command line live. So it's just running the, the analyzer continually in the background. Uh, and that's actually what I use with Emacs, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there are some dedicated Emacs users. Uh, uh, I first learned that when I was talking with Hans, one of the engineers on our uh, design languages team, our frameworks team, and I, I referred to his editor as VI, and he very quickly corrected me to say that it was Emacs. Uh, <laughs> you know, in a nice way. Hans, a total nice guy. Not. Uh, 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 it was a, a learning moment for me. Uh, and speaking of learning moments, we have had one over the past hour, and now uh, it's the end of our time. So. Uh, First, let me say thank you to our four panelists here. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, for pleasure, Andrew. And uh, I want to say thank you to all of our uh, stream viewers here. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed what you just saw. But we have a lot more coming for you. Uh, so this is the end of our Q&A. But if you stay on the stream, we have four tech talks from the Flutter team coming to you. Uh, these will provide more technical detail on some of the exciting features and announcements that you saw during our keynote. And then after those, we have 11 more talks from Flutter's global developer community. These are Flutter coders uh, who have put together tech talks going into uh, all sorts of things from navigation to animations, deep dives into all sorts of Flutter tech. Those will be up on the website as well. Uh, there'll be a content drop for those. So, uh, but first up, We'll be having uh, Mariam Hasnani back with us again, along with John Ryan, to present uh, from mobile app to progressive web app. They're going to go through the process of taking a Flutter app that works on mobile and deploying it to the web. So stay right here. We have a lot more Flutter to show you. <laughs>